You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC88 Paradise, the series where we talk about classic Japanese PC games for the NEC PC88, and also discuss how they are related to other classic games that you may be familiar with. In the last video I talked about XZR, the very first game in the Exile series by Nihon Telenet, released in 1988, and today I'll be talking about the sequel XZR2, the game that was later remade on the Genesis and Turbo Graphics as Exile. Again, for clarity's sake, throughout this video I will be referring to the two PC games as XZR and the console games as Exile. In my previous video I gave a bit of a harsh review of XZR1, so today the big question is, did XZR2 turn out any better than the first? The short answer is, a resounding yes. XZR2 is also a game that has its issues, but it is overall a much cleaner and more enjoyable experience. It's amazing that it was released only a year after the original, and I can definitely see why they chose to remake this one for consoles later. We'll get into the details soon, but first let's take a look at the packaging. This game is more common and a lot easier to find than the first one in my experience. Maybe Telenet was a bit more confident in the quality of this one. The text on the back is mostly bragging about how much they've powered up the game over the original. Playability up, faster scrolling and no more getting kicked out of the shops after you buy something. Wow, that's some self-awareness there. Glad they decided to fix their mistakes. Data up, more disk space used for more visuals and cutscenes. Power up, more events and six exciting maps. Graphics up, boss characters up. Power up. Drug up. Oh boy, hope the drug system is actually worth using this time. Magic up. Oh yes, of course we want more magic. If you're confused by the extra K and why I'm pronouncing it magic, I explained this in the previous video. Character up. In addition to the assassins of the previous game, we'll meet a few new major characters who were also in exile. Let's open it up. There was probably more stuff in here originally, but my copy has only the manual and floppy disks. You may have noticed that the cover says CD and Disc. An 8 centimeter CD containing two remix tracks from the game was originally included. Those who've seen my previous videos might be wondering if this is one of the games where you can choose to use the CD-ROM drive for the music, and the answer is no. That would make a lot of sense though for a PC-88 game that says CD and Disc on the cover. The black and white manual gives a long introduction to the world of XZR and the events of the previous game as well as an introduction to the Templars, who will make their first appearance here. And of course, there are some character illustrations as usual. Once again, this is a universal manual made to work with every PC release of the game. The floppy disks, again, are contained in this plastic Telenet sleeve that I don't really care for. This time, there are four disks instead of three. You can see also that my disk A is missing the original Telenet sleeve, and has been replaced with a plain one instead. To start the game, once again we simply insert the first two discs into the system. Whoa, okay, you got my attention, let's check out this opening. Once again we're introduced to our main cast of characters. You'll notice that Sufferwaldi is still here. He wasn't in exile, so it'll be interesting to see how he fits into the story of XZR2. We are also introduced to the new characters. If you've played Exile, you may remember these guys. The most important new character is a Templar named Yug de Pain. Then you also have Ninkan, a Buddhist monk who Saddler meets in Japan, and Joffrey, a bard who he meets in India. As we can see in the opening, while Saddler's first adventure took place almost entirely in the Middle East, XZR2 will take him all around the world. The music makes this opening feel a little less exciting than that of the first game, though it definitely has its moments. Overall, there are a lot more graphics in the opening than there were in the first one, so let's chalk this up as a win for the second game. After the opening, we get a menu where we can already see another difference between this game and the first. Instead of one game save, we get six. And again, all of them are saved on disk A of the game. So let's go ahead and do an initial start. Welcome to XZR2 world. You will be Saddler, who is the Sheikh of New Assassin. You must first visit a Assassin village on the Elbers Mountains. Now open the XZR2 world under your eyes. Whoa, already we have to change disks. 
It turns out that the disc B that we are removing now contains only the opening and ending of the game. So we're thrown immediately into the new base and map screen of the game. I love the really warm sounding FM synth here. And I like that the music doesn't change when you open the map. This screen is just a much more pleasant experience than the first game. Watch! It's little things like this that actually go a long way to make the game feel smoother. So let's go to that assassin village. The overhead view is also a lot smoother than the first game, though Kindy is still red for some reason. I didn't realize until later in the game, but you can even walk diagonally in this one. They also weren't kidding about the shops being better this time. Entering feels much smoother and you don't get kicked out when you buy something. You still can't sell items or weapons like you can in Exile though. So it looks like we start with all four of the main cast in our party, unlike in Exile where we have to gather them one by one in the village. A small difference, but overall I was shocked by how close the story of Exile follows XCR2. It begins when at the mosque in the village we hear that a monster has been appearing lately in the Syrian desert. So we travel to an oasis where Sadler gets sucked into a pit of quicksand. Wow, this part looks almost exactly the same as Exile. One cool thing is that we can leave the first stage in order to replenish our HP and save. In Exile, the first stage can have kind of a high learning curve right away at the beginning of the game since you can't leave until you defeat the boss. To be fair though, it makes more sense in Exile. The entrance is a pit of quicksand after all. So let's talk about the gameplay of XCR2. Of course you press up to jump again, but otherwise it's surprisingly different from XCR1. For one thing, you can't crawl, but the main difference is that the action is much faster. This overall feels a lot better to me since a lot of the stages can be maze-like and being able to explore quickly makes things a lot easier. But on the other hand, the slower battles of the first game allowed for a lot more precision control. Despite how fast you can move in this one, your sword doesn't have a very long reach, making it difficult to attack enemies without also running into them. Inevitably, this becomes a game of stats, where you mindlessly ram into the enemies and hope your strength and defense is good enough to kill them without taking much damage. Bouncing around madly while swinging my sword makes me feel like I'm playing Sorcerian or something. The winning strategy for this game is the same throughout. When you get to a new dungeon, you spend some time leveling up near the entrance and leaving to restore your HP and save. By the way, you restore your HP by exiting to the map in this game, just like in Exile. They've gotten rid of the inns from the first game. Luckily, leveling up usually doesn't take very long, so you won't be spending that much time grinding. While doing this, you can also use the money you're accumulating to buy better equipment if there is any available. Once you get to the point that you can smash through the enemies without taking much damage, it's time to fully explore the stage and find the boss. Here's one issue with the game that actually becomes pretty annoying. When you do find the boss room, you become unable to exit, and unlike the first game, you also can't open the menu in the boss rooms. This often catches you off guard and unprepared to fight the boss. You're usually going to want to restore your HP and MP with items and turn on your magic before the bosses, but you can't do so unless you know you're about to enter a boss room. So I often found myself unable to defeat a boss until at least my second try when I knew its location. One strategy I adopted later is saving every so often before entering a door, just in case it's a boss room. Oh yeah, unlike XZR1 or Exile, you can save your game during the action stages or literally anywhere in this one, and this is where having multiple save slots comes in handy. It's a good idea to have at least one safety save out on the overhead parts, so that you can use another slot for saving within the action stages. If you're not careful, you can easily save yourself into inescapable trouble in the action stages, as I'll show you later. Next, let's talk about the magic in this game. I really like the changes they made here. You have only three different magics that get gradually stronger as you level up. First, you have standard attack magic, which is a straightforward projectile. Next, there is healing magic, which is super useful and gives you a bit of HP back each time you swing your sword. Finally, there's full body magic, which creates a shield around Sadler and fires shots in all directions. This one is generally not so useful in my experience. So we've talked about magic, what's next? 
Drugs, of course. Since this is a game of stats, as I said earlier, drugs which raise your strength or defense can sometimes be a little more useful here than in the first game. But I'd still recommend saving most of your inventory space for the drugs that restore your HP and MP. The one maybe interesting drug that they added in this game is the peyote, which makes Sadler float freely around the screen. I could see this being useful for shortcuts at certain parts, but unfortunately I never really found the opportunity to take advantage of this during my playthrough. One mishap I had with the drug system in this game is that I accidentally used a drug or maybe a combination of drugs that caused Saddler to immediately die after the drug's effect wore off. I was also stupid enough to save my game after taking the drug, so now I had a game save where Saddler was a dead man walking. I looked desperately for a drug in my inventory that might cure Saddler, but it was no use. Thank goodness for multiple save slots. I had to start over from the beginning of this stage, but it sure beats having to start again from the beginning of the game. One more weird quirk about this game. Opening the menu clears the screen of all enemies. I'm guessing this has something to do with making sure you don't take any cheap hits after closing the menu or something, but if you want, you can use this to your advantage and cheaply progress forward without having to worry about taking any hits. I found it useful at a few points for getting out of a stage while low on HP. So after the first stage boss, we get the letter from Yug and go to Jerusalem to meet him. At Jerusalem you have met Mr. Yug de Pain, who is the leader of Templar. Let you go to South France for helping the heretic Cathars. Now open the second stage. So, as I said before, XCR2's story and progression is almost the same as Exiles. You have the same maps and locations within them. The layouts of almost all the overhead parts and action stages, however, are completely different. One questionable choice they made here is tree mazes, where you basically have to find an invisible path through to the other side. Hey, I found a shortcut through a hedge maze. Go away, you little! These parts are pretty annoying, and they were smart to remove them when they made Exile. Que signifie? Okay, the rest of these aren't in English, so I'm done with this bit. Another big difference is that a few stages were removed entirely for Exile. For instance, in XCR2, when you rescue Ninkan, there is a prison stage you have to go through to find him. In Exile, this is simply resolved by finding a key and a pickaxe and opening his cell on the overhead screen. Parts like this are a real shame because as I mentioned in my last video, Exile's biggest weakness is its short length. Additional stages would have been a welcome addition, indeed. So what else is different? Lots of small details in the story have been changed, but here are a few interesting examples. In Exile, this shepherd has lost one of his sheep, and you find it shortly after at the next overhead location. So you go back to the shepherd, take him to his sheep, and he helps you get the prism out of its mouth, which you need to progress the game. This makes a lot of sense in RPG terms, doesn't it? But in XCR2, it's a little weird. The shepherd tells you he lost his sheep, just like in Exile, but after you find it, going back to the shepherd doesn't do anything. Instead, later on, once Sadler realizes he needs the prism, he simply yanks it out of the sheep's mouth by force. So much for Andre the shepherd. Even if we go back to him after getting the prism, he says he's still looking for the sheep and Sadler doesn't say anything. Guess he'll never find his sheep in this version. I'm going to get into spoilers here, and it's important to note that these will also be spoilers for Exile. Since I highly recommend that you play through Exile if you haven't already, you might want to skip past this section. So where does Sufferwaldi make an appearance? Well, basically only at one point in the game. In the scene where Yug tells Sadler to follow him through the mysterious door, here we get to see the area inside and the tree with the faces earlier than we do in Exile. And also Sufferwaldi comes and pleads with Sadler not to enter the door. Hey, that's pretty good advice. Unfortunately, Sadler ultimately decides to go through the door anyway, just like he did in Exile. Shortly after, we meet Fakil in the past, and find out that he was the one who opened the door. I like this explanation, and it was unfortunately removed in Exile. There, the door that had been sealed forever is just suddenly opened for some reason. 
Fakil also explains to Sadler and Yug that they've traveled to the past, whereas in exile, Yug seems to just figure it out for himself. But these are just small trivial differences. Let's get to the good stuff. Where you had the end boss of exile, instead Yug uses the time travel item from the first game to send Sadler into the future for a whole new world map of the game that wasn't in exile. This is a modern day portion of the game, just like we saw in XZR1. Yug is still at large and we have to find him in modern day 1989. The first location here is New York, where the people mention the recent assassination of the president carried out by Sadler in the previous game. This area has you going through a maze of subway stations in order to get to a different part of the city. These radical skateboard dudes seem determined to skate right into Sadler and deal him damage. And sometimes, sometimes they're racing on the boards and the board starts to shake and wham! Well, need a spatula to peel you off the street. I'm afraid for that, the punishment is death. Sadly, all of these subway stages are exactly the same. Most likely, they didn't have enough disk space to make each one unique. You eventually reach the United Nations building where they know who Sadler is and everything about Yug and his plot. Guess they are supposed to be like the Illuminati or something. They send him to India to find Yug and the final stage of the game. I like to imagine Sadler traveling on an airplane during the modern day part of the game, and come to think of it, this is kind of implied to have happened in the first game as well, since he visited both the USSR and the US. Throughout this game, I never used a walkthrough, and though this is partly because I had just recently played through Exile and remembered the gist of what needs to be done at each part, this should still stand as a testament to how different this game is from XZR1. But this part in India is one part where I can see some people having trouble. There seems to be no obvious way forward. The weapon shop here is selling the same weapons that you can buy in New York, so most people won't need to buy them here. But if you're paying attention, and luckily I eventually figured this out, the shop owner here knows Sadler's name for some reason, and he tells you to buy his weapons even if you already have them. Buy them and he teaches you a spell and tells you to chant it between the two trees. So you go walk between the two trees nearby, Sadler chants the incantation, and voila, the entrance to the final dungeon. Inside we find Yug, along with all of Sadler's friends, who encourage Sadler to help Yug in his plan to destroy and recreate the world from scratch. Yug asks Sadler to enter the stairway below, which you have no choice but to do in order to progress the game. If you exit later on, Sadler will discover that Yug is gone and his friends were just lifeless dummies. This last action stage of the game is literally a vast maze of the same five or six different screens repeated over and over again. For this part I was really tempted to look for a map online, but I had gotten this far without any help so I decided to tough it out. It took many hours of wandering, but I somehow found my way through. The end boss is pretty different from the one in Exile, and that background is delightfully freaky. It looked like this! <laughs> With my stats at this point in the game, I didn't have much trouble defeating the boss. Then we find ourselves back at the mysterious door in the Temple of Solomon, and we can go back through the freaky face tree door to get back to Sadler's own time period. The ending lists a bunch of things that are bad about the world, then it lists a bunch of good things about the world. Wow, that's a lot of good and bad things they were able to come up with. We then get the standard end credits, along with illustrations of Sadler reuniting with his friends. Well, what can I say? Overall, I enjoyed this game a lot more than XCR1, and I would even recommend you play it for yourself if you're interested. Even without Japanese knowledge, you might be able to make your way through using a walkthrough of Exile. Like Exile, the way XCR2 progresses is pretty straightforward, which to me is the most important thing. I don't happen to care much for old RPGs that are really cryptic about how to progress forward. I also love that the game is quite a bit longer than Exile. This one feels like just about the right length. I like how fast the gameplay is in the action stages, but the way you attack enemies is so imprecise I may actually slightly prefer the action in XCR1. The modern day segment at the end of XCR2 still feels a bit too wacky, much like it did in XCR1. While it's great that it makes the game longer, I think scrapping it for the remake was the right move. Maybe replacing it with something else entirely would have been the most ideal. As it is, Exile is far too short and the ending feels quite abrupt. 
So next, let's look at some secret codes for the game. Press F5 during the opening to access the music mode. This is listed in the game's manual, so it isn't really a secret. The music mode in XZR1 can also be accessed the same way. But XZR2 has some additional tricks that can be done here. When it tells you to press the spacebar at the music mode, instead type Marina on the keyboard before pressing space. This secret is revealed if you try to boot disk B of the game. What it does is allow you to see what the sound channels are doing as the music plays. I don't know about you, but I find this kind of thing fascinating. One interesting thing is you can see that none of the game's BGM aside from the ending use any of the SSG channels. This might be partly because they reserved the SSG channels for the sound effects, but most likely the composer also thought that SSG sounded kind of old and cheap. Personally, I really like the sound of SSG mixed with FM channels, which is what Falcom usually did. Overall, I like the soundtrack of XZR2 even more than XZR1. 2 generally has a more pleasant sound, has more varied tracks, and doesn't overuse the same two tracks throughout the game like the first one does. I also should make clear that the soundtrack of XZR2 is completely different from Exiles, though I actually noticed one short melody they managed to sneak into the TurboGrafx version. Listen for the melody in the bass line of the PC-88 version. I wouldn't be surprised if there are actually more examples of reused melodies, but this is the only one I noticed. Back at the sound mode screen, there's actually one more secret code. After typing Marina, instead of pressing space, next type Mai Takai, and you get this weird minigame where you play a ball trying to collect P symbols without touching the pluses or asterisks. It has to be played with the keyboard, and the controls are momentum based, so it's a lot harder than it looks. Like the first game, XZR2 was ported to a couple of other PCs, but this time there was no X1 Turbo version. The PC-98 version isn't too rare, so this time I can show you some game footage. Again, it's pretty much a straight port of the PC-88 game without utilizing any of the advantages of the PC-98. On the MSX, XZR2 looks much less simple than the first one did. This time they seem to have gone all out trying to make a worthy imitation of the PC-88 version using the MSX2's limited palette and resolution. This version has an English patch available, but it is listed as unfinished and it is more of an English patch. The translator probably wasn't a native speaker of English, but I'm sure using this patch would make for a much better experience than struggling to play through the game without understanding any Japanese. And as I'm sure you all know by now, XZR2 was later remade as Exile on the PC Engine in 1991, and translated to English by Working Designs the following year. This is my overall favorite game in the series, and the one I recommend the most. Working Designs removed all the drug and religious references for the English version, so that the Christians became the Clispins, for instance. This makes it feel more like a fictional world rather than the real one, which actually kind of works better in my opinion. They also increased the difficulty a little bit, but you can restore it to the original Japanese difficulty via a patch if you want. The Japanese version really is way too easy near the end of the game, so I personally don't really think the patch is necessary. I can't believe I'm actually defending the changes a localizer decided to make to a game, but in this case I really do kind of like them. The Mega Drive version of Exile was also released in 1991, after the PC Engine version, and localized to English the following year by Telenet's own overseas division called Renovation. I prefer the colors in the TurboGrafx version as well as the physics, which feels slightly different here. Of course it also lacks the cutscenes and CD soundtrack of the Turbo version. The English translation is not especially good, but is a bit more wordy than the Turbo version due to using a smaller font. The English version also removed some parts which included visual violence and pixelated nudity. Overall, the Turbo version is superior, but this one is still decent and worthy of a playthrough if you happen to be a Genesis fan. And lastly, since this will be my last video about this series, I might as well talk briefly about Exile 2, known as Exile Wicked Phenomenon in English. The cool thing about this game is that you finally get to play as characters other than Saddler, though most of them are not very useful since they move so slowly. The game removes the series' iconic map and base screen, opting instead to have each overhead part connected to the next one via an action stage. The biggest issue with the game is the scroll distance from the character. I don't know what they were thinking. 
Famously, working designs also messed with the difficulty and made the English version way too difficult. I remember spending hours and hours grinding in order to finish it as a teenager, so I really wouldn't recommend playing this one without the patch to restore the original difficulty. Still, I played all the way through the Japanese version of the game just before making this video, and I have to say that it isn't an especially good game, regardless of the difficulty. Just like the first Exile, it's way too short, and the stages, save for the final one, are all far too simple. Overall, it feels like a sloppy game that wasn't made with much love or care. Still, it isn't unplayable or anything, and you will probably get some enjoyment out of it if you liked the first. The bonus segment with the voice actors at the end of the Japanese version teases another sequel, but unfortunately that never happened. Judging by Wicked Phenomenon, I doubt another sequel would have been very good, but it still would have been interesting to see another Exile game. I miss this series, and I miss Nihon Telenet, but we'll always have the games they left us, and I am glad to have finally played the oldest games in the series on the NEC PC-88. Thanks for watching. I'm interested to hear what all of you think of this series, so please leave a comment and let me know. As always, please like, share, subscribe, and click the bell. I hope to see you back again for my next video here on Basement Brothers. Bye bye for now.